Technology Officer. Okay. Yeah, we really do know who you are, Kay. Yeah, I know. And I just swung by the store and said, give me Kay's regular. And they knew. And they knew. Yeah. Well, maybe sort of like that. <laughs> Hi, everybody. It's nice to be here today. And I'm just loving this group. So thank you for taking some time as you first arrive in Vegas. I know you all want to be out there on the floor, right? <laughs> no, you're happy to be here. I am excited to have a few minutes to share with you a little bit about my journey. My journey as a leader, my journey as a technologist, um, and my journey as a woman. I'm kind of looking out there and I'm loving that I'm seeing some women, some men, um, and I love that diversity. And I think there is a lot to be said for how strong we are when we're all working together. We all have different approaches, we all have different voices, and I hope over the next 20 to 30 minutes, I leave you with a few things to think about as you go out of here on your own journey. Ooh. How many of you in here started out in a career with computer science or software engineering? Can you raise your hand? Okay, that's great. Well, that's where I started. However, most of you were not born yet. <laughs> Okay, so I started off with a degree in computer science and mathematics long before the title of data scientist was invented. And I started my career after college at Chevron. And the reason I went to Chevron was partly because of data. I had an emphasis in artificial intelligence way back in the 80s. And I was excited about how I could use AI in a very large, complicated company. And I spent about 10 years at Chevron and learned a tremendous amount. And I'm going to come back to that time in my life in a little bit and share with you some of the things I learned and some of the mistakes I made. After being there for 10 years, I woke up one morning and said, oh my gosh, I'm actually a technologist. So I took a short drive uh, from where I lived in California to the Silicon Valley, and I became the first CIO for McAfee. This was back in the days, this was before the year 2000, when computer viruses were kind of a new thing. In fact, McAfee was the first US-based software company that was doing real-time updates for virus signatures. So I got in on the ground floor of the security industry, and it was a lot of fun. And I did that for about five years. During that five years, McAfee grew from about 250 million in revenue to well over a billion. And we're without a doubt the leader in antivirus. So I did what most people do at that point in their career. I retired. <laughs> because I decided I had done everything I wanted to do. And so my husband, my wonderful husband, and I decided what we would do next was start a family. Aww. That's where you're supposed to sigh now. So these are my beautiful twin daughters who are not this size anymore, but I have to look at these pictures to remember how cute and lovable they were <laughs> before they became teenagers. Anyways, um, I decided I was going to be retired, I was going to be a stay-at-home mom, and I was going to rock it. And how many of you have a similar story? Uh-huh. I got two years in and said, oh my god, I'm terrible at this. <laughs> Not only was I kind of terrible at it, I actually wasn't loving it. And so my husband, my amazing husband, said, you know, I think maybe you want to go back to work. And I said, oh my gosh, thank you. Yes, I do. The next day the phone rang. Two weeks later, I had a job. I went back to um, the industry in the Valley, and I was the CIO for Verisign, another security company that you may or may not remember. After that, I ended up joining Adobe, also as their CIO, and was at Adobe for about 10 years, and was part of the team that transformed Adobe from a software company to a cloud services company. And then, the next obvious career move, I went to Starbucks. <laughs> <laughs> Completely obvious. So, you know, I just looked at this journey the other night and reminded myself that this was a journey of reinvention. And it was a continual reinvention of technology and the technology industry 
but it was also a reinvention of my own skill sets. So let me just kind of walk you through that timeline with a different lens. When I started my career, it was mainframes. It was mainframes and green screens. I heard a few little, I know a few of you out there remember that too, green screens. And in fact, I remember when the first personal computer showed up at Chevron and was available to the business groups. And so for a while, PCs were the coolest, newest thing. And then shortly after that, client server, another way of transformation in tech. And everybody had to learn new skills. And all those skills you learn in the mainframes, you had to relearn for PC, and then you had to relearn them for client server. And you guys know how the story goes, because now it's probably getting kind of current. Then the internet came along. And so about the time when I was at McAfee, everything was about the internet. And then there was the dot-com, and we had online everything, and then there was the com crash, and then there was mobile, and then we had app everything, and here we are, and we have AI, ML, everything. And what's amazing when you kind of step back and think about that, the tech industry over the last 35 years has reinvented itself about every three to seven years. And that reinventing doesn't mean you throw away everything you knew, but it does mean you have to adapt. And if you as a technologist or a business leader are also in an industry where you're seeing reinvention, you also have to really think about how do I continue to learn and grow? And so I'm gonna share with you a few ways that i found to keep growing and learning and reinventing. Does this resonate with you guys? Yeah, okay. Hopefully you remember some of those transitions. So I'm gonna come back to why Starbucks? What took me from the Silicon Valley to the often rainy Seattle? Beautiful that it is, but often rainy. And it was really three things. The first is really grounded in the mission of Starbucks. And this is the mission. To inspire and nurture the human spirit, one person, one cup, and one neighborhood at a time. So that story uh, that Kay just shared about, we know her name when she comes in and it's a bright spot of her day to have that cup of coffee or other beverage in her hand is something I hear all the time. Because Starbucks actually sells an experience. They sell a human connection, a place of connection. If you think about Starbucks, if you think about the last time you were in Starbucks, I bet you're thinking about something like, hey, that's where I went with my kid after the ball game on Saturday, or that's where I had a meeting with a friend of mine, or that's where I went to just get some time away from the house so that I could study or work on my project, or maybe it's the place that you swung by on your way to work to grab your mobile order and pay coffee because you just wanted that warmth in your hand on the way to work. And all of those things I just described were about how you felt, not about the cup of coffee. And so what I loved when I started thinking about Starbucks is I've always been a technologist who thinks a lot about the human at the center of technology. And I think the very best technology is technology that you don't notice. So many of you out there, all of you probably, are uh, Tableau, practitioners. When you do an amazing Tableau dashboard, what happens? Do people get excited? They like see things they never saw before. You just simplified their world. It's about that emotion. Of course it was hard. You had to build it from technology, bits and bytes and data and, and gigs and megs. And, but really, you're simplifying somebody's job or maybe you're giving them an insight they couldn't have before. So it's all about the human experience. So that's the first reason I went to Starbucks. The second reason is I really like scale. So let me just give you some data. So today, right this second, there are over 31,000 Starbucks stores around the world. Okay, that's a, that's a good number. We have more than 400,000 employees. We call our employees partners. So those are baristas, 
those are regional managers, those are people managing the supply chain, and they're technologists. It's all the people that really run the brand. We run in 82 markets around the world, and on any given week, we have about 100 million customer occasions in our stores. 100 million. And all of those 100 million occasions adds up to about $26 billion a year. Now, many of you work in companies that are that size, or maybe close to that size, but here's what I want you to really look at with that number. $26 billion, $5 at a time. Most of it comes between 7 in the morning and 10 in the morning. Okay, now you've got a hard tech scale problem because you want that transaction to happen in real time. If it's a loyal customer like, hey, we want to know who she is, how many stars she has, we want to surprise and delight her in the store. And so suddenly now you've got a hard tech problem. So that's my second reason for thinking Starbucks was a great opportunity. And then the third reason really is about cool tech. This is the vision statement for the Starbucks technology organization that I lead. And what you'll notice here is the same theme as you saw in the mission for the company, which is we do technology specifically to amplify human connections. But it's a lot of cool tech. So one that you might know of is the mobile application. How many people here use Starbucks mobile application? Oh my gosh, that's great. Okay, how many of you got a, or gave a Starbucks gift card this year? Probably almost every hand went up there. Both of those are great examples of Starbucks technology that's focused on amplification of a human experience. In addition to mobile applications, we have to think about how do we converge physical retail with digital. So think about this. When you order your lot, your mobile application, that latte order has to show up in the store in a way that a barista can make it. And that can't be a separate channel from the Uber Eats orders or the orders in the line. So you have to converge all of those different <coughs> digital channels into the physical space. And then you have to integrate all of that with your physical inventory. And that's a lot. And so that's another really fun aspect of big tech. Another thing you might not see or notice in the stores is a whole lot of smart equipment. So the newest version of espresso machines that we are rolling out across the world actually are completely IoT enabled so that we know the quality of every single shop hold in real time. So we can identify through machine learning algorithms when we need to do maintenance on equipment before a customer ever complains or before a barista even notices any changes on the equipment. So lots of opportunities for really cool big tech. So those are the three reasons that I went from technology companies to Starbucks. And in many ways, Starbucks has a rich and complicated technology stack that I've continued to hone my craft on. But throughout my entire career, there's really four lessons I've learned. And the funny thing about lessons is you learn them over and over again. Has anybody else had that experience? Yeah, okay, so I'm gonna share with you some very um, telling stories about myself, very humbling stories. I'm gonna be super transparent and share with you some things that I've made mistakes on many times, as well as things that I've learned that hopefully will help you maybe not make those same mistakes. So let me start. I always love this. Some of this sounds like motherhood and apple fly. Do what you love, do what you love and everything else will take care of itself. And I think there's some truth to that. You know, I started off my story telling you that I was a computer science geek. I love that. So I ended up going to software technology companies. That was all great. I'm now in a company with mission and values that really resonates for me as, a, as an individual and a human. However, that doesn't mean it really was as straight of a lot I just described. I sort of do the, the highlights. Now let me tell you some times when that line didn't feel so straight and when I actually did not believe I was doing what I love and in fact I might have been doing what I did not love and why that was actually a good thing. So when I was at Chevron, I had probably been working, I don't know, six or seven years and my leader came to me one day and I, I should tell you, I had built this really cool team. I mean, I had built this team from the ground up 
They were amazing technologists. I've handpicked each one of them. I had, I had coddled them and trained them, and it was awesome. And we were lighting the world on fire, and I was just like, I just kept going to my, my leader saying, can I have more? I want more. I want to keep this, and I want more. One day, my leader came to me and said, Jerry, there's this job that's open over there. I think you should apply for that job over there. And I was crushed. And I was like, well, I, yeah, I don't know. I really like this thing I'm doing right now, and I just want to do more. Why don't you just give me that team over there and add it to my, to my scope? And um, he went away. And he came back a couple weeks later and said, Jerry, I think you really need to apply for that job over there. And I kind of blew him off again. And, and the third time he came back, I thought to myself, I think he's telling me something. <laughs> so um, it was the last day for the open posting where I could apply for the job. And I literally, well, it was back in the day, there was an, I couldn't email the application. I had to print it off, I had to fill it out, and I had to carry it to the HR department. And so here it is, five minutes to five. And in the evening, the last day of, the, of this opening and they have this little basket on the counter, and you're supposed to put your application in the basket. I literally stand there and tears start rolling down my face. And this HR professional behind the counter says, you don't have to turn that in. And I said, yes I do. And I, I put it in the little basket and I'm crying and I go home crying and I cry to my husband and of course the next day I go to the office and I got the job. At which point I'm really very unhappy about that. So I start this job, and every day, I swear to you, every day for two years, I grumped my way into the office, oh, I hate this job. And every day I'd do the job, and I'd go home at night, I hate this job, and I'd do it all again. And let me tell you what the job was. The job was a staff position. And the staff position was to be a process design consultant for senior executive teams at, at Chevron. So you take a team of people, maybe seven or eight people, who are having a hard time solving a problem, some kind of big business problem, and you help facilitate them through problem solving and process design, right? I was a facilitative leadership coach, and I hated it every day. But you know what I got really good at? I got really good at facilitating people to talk to each other and I got really good at listening, and I got really good at not having to own the outcome of everything. It was amazing. And I hated the job the very last day I had it. I was sure it was a thing that was like destroying my career. And then I went and got this CIO job at McAfee. And lo and behold, I figured out that the skills I had learned in that job were the most valuable toolkit I had, and I have used the skills from that experience every single day since then. So do what you love, but be ready that sometimes you're gonna do what you don't love to do more of what you love, and give yourself room for that. Which kind of leads me to my second learning that I have to keep learning over and over again. Listen, listen. So I listened to that, that leader I had way back when. I might have listened sooner, might have been wise, but I still listened eventually. And I want to give you stories about three people whose, well, whose names I will not give you, um, but are real stories. And I want to explain three, three opportunities I had to learn to listen. And by the way, I'm not done with this one. I have to learn to listen all the time. The first was someone that I worked with. She was on my team, and we butted heads. Has anybody ever worked with someone on your team? Okay, good. I know there's a few hands up there, and it's okay if you didn't raise your hand, because I know you did raise your hand. Um, because we've all had this experience, and you know how you start these relationships? I'm right, they're wrong, I'm right, they're wrong, I'm right, they're wrong. You know, and after a while, you might convince yourself of that, which means you stop listening, because you're pretty sure you're right and they're wrong. And then, one day, if, you've, if you're lucky like I was, somebody sort of inserts themselves in, into that relationship and says, no, no, no. You need to sit down and listen to each other. And so you sit down and begrudgingly, you sort of listen to each other. And the next thing you discover is that actually, neither of you is completely right or wrong. Maybe you're both a little right and you're both a little wrong. And that somewhere in there is the right answer. 
And, and what I learned from that particular scenario was there was something about being brave enough to be vulnerable enough to listen. And it was really a hard thing because it wasn't like this was my peer, this was someone who reported to me. And so we're already kind of set in that mode of, no, I must be right. I have to tell them what needs to get done. Whereas in fact, I became a better leader by using their strengths. And to this day, I'm still a very, very good friend of that person. And we have these wonderful candid dialogues. And when we agree on something, it is magical because I will tell you, it means we are really, really right. And when we disagree, we find a way to move through it. And when she was part of my team, we could agree to disagree. And if I had to decide, I would decide and we would move forward. So be brave enough to have those tough conversations because they really will work. Here's the second one. Um, we all think about mentors. And when you look out and you think about your mentor, who do you think of? People who you look up to, maybe a peer, but I would suggest you need to also look in your organization. The best coach I ever had in my entire career worked for me. In fact, they worked for me when I was a very new manager because this person was brave enough to come and sit down and tell me how I was showing up. And there's nothing more powerful than someone on your team telling you how you show up because you have to take that seriously. That's like your kids coming in and telling you, you you dressed poorly. Like my daughter would say, this is not what I should wear. But anyways, um, so having mentors who are in your team and giving them the opportunity to tell you what they're observing is super helpful. So use that moment to listen to folks in your team and ask them for that feedback. Um, another uh, person who was part of my team I would ask to come and shadow me in meetings because one of the things I discovered about myself is sometimes I get so excited about ideas I have that I'm not listening well to what others are telling me in meetings. And so I would take someone who would shadow me and they would do nothing but listen. They would take notes. I would usually introduce them as someone who was going to just help me take notes so that I didn't miss anything. But they would observe it. And then after the meeting, I will sit with those, that person and I will say, okay, so here's what I heard. What did you hear? And I find myself missing parts of the conversation because I'm so in it. And so sometimes think about, especially for those most important conversations you're going to have or those meetings you're going to be in, have someone shadow you and then use them to help debrief. And then the most important thing about listening to other voices, say thank you. Because if you're gonna be vulnerable enough to listen to people and people give you great advice, make sure they feel appreciated for that because you want them to tell you the next time that they see something you can learn from. Share your vision. Boy, that's as good as do what you love, right? How many of you heard, share your vision? You just have to have a big vision and a big picture. I'll tell you one thing that really is important, words. Words matter. Fewer words matter more. So even if you have a great vision and you have passion and you have conviction, if you don't have simple words, no one will understand. So let me give you three really quick examples. We do not have an IT department at Starbucks at all, anywhere in the world. We have something called Starbucks technology. When I say IT, what do you think of? Just shout it out. IT. Help desk. What else? Tech support. It's broken. It's the network. Okay, that doesn't sound like very much fun. When I say Starbucks technology, what do you think of? Innovation. I heard coffee? I don't know. <laughs> Innovation, for sure. And, and your mind is sort of is broader. Tech, such a broad word. Okay, so that word really matters. So, when I got to Starbucks, the first thing I did was change the name of the group. There is no IT, and if I'm ever in a meeting, including the board meeting, and someone says IT, I stop them and say, we don't have that here, we have Starbucks technology. And what happened to the team, as soon as the name was changed, they stood a little straighter. It was like having permission to talk about a whole different set of things. Now, you still have to do all the other stuff. There is still tech support activities that go on, but there's something important about the word. Just remember that example. Here's another one. 
Um, shortly after we got there, we needed a vision statement for the technology organization. So we have three phrases. Talented technologists delivering today, leading into the future. That's it. That's all we had to do. And what's cool about that is it's so much simpler than a big, long thing that says 99.999% uptime. Right? Not that, on time, on budget projects, nobody wants to do that. But to be a talented technologist leading into the future sounds pretty cool. Words matter. And suddenly now you've got a whole team of people behind you excited to be part of that organization. And here's another one. This is, a, this is one we're using now in our current iteration um, as an organization. Innovate, iterate, scale. Innovate, iterate, scale. So what that's talking about is the importance of agile delivery, test and learn but ultimately you've got to get to scale. And suddenly people start getting more motivated about, I can try something as an innovation. I can iterate to see if it's gonna work, but I acknowledge I eventually have to get to 31,000 stores and make it run. Um, so that's all good. So sharing your vision is super important. Last comment on this is find your amplifiers. There are people in every organization who will amplify your message. Once you get your three words right, find the 50 people who will say it 50 times a week. And then last but not least is keep learning. Three really fast, or actually four really fast examples of this, tech skills. Um, for those of you who do have um, a deep technology background, you probably find that it gets out of date really fast. Um, I spent this last weekend sitting on my kitchen counter working on TensorFlow. Does anybody know what that is? Yeah, I didn't really understand it two weeks ago, but I'm learning. And you have to find ways to do that, to keep learning new skills. Have broadening experiences. Get out and be part of boards. If it's a nonprofit board, great, sit on a board. Go to events like this. Take a learning tour to the Silicon Valley. Just get out and broaden your experiences. Third, focus on management growth, especially if you lead a team. Think about coaches, mentors, and classes. Fourth, Business insights. This is one of my favorites. So no matter what business you work in, no matter what agency you're part of, you need to get into the business. So here's how I do that at Starbucks. Once a month, I go to my local neighborhood store and I work behind the counter. Literally. Now, I can't make a drink to save my life, but I clean the counters and I greet customers and I will do sampling. The reason I do it is because I need to be in the business. I need to keep learning what that emotional connection is like, and I need to see where I can help and be more effective. So whatever your business is, get inside the business. And then my last insight about keep learning is about the younger generation. And for me, I'm lucky because I have some built in. I have my twin daughters who um, are still with us at home and, and not quite through high school. And all I have to do is listen to them. And I learned so much about what the next generation is going to think about and struggle with and be excited about, and that helps me stay fresh. Now, those are the four things, and that's all I have, but here's the thing, you gotta repeat it over and over and over again. It never ends. So every week, you just start at the top and you go right down the list again. Make sense? Yeah? Okay. Well, that's kind of all I had for you today. I hope that was helpful. I hope it gave you some things to think about. I want to thank all of you for letting me spend time with you. And I'm looking forward to meeting all of you at some other events throughout this week. And let me invite Kay back up.